Hi, this is Carrie Corbett Owen from BodyWisePerfectSize.com speaking to Evelyn Triboli. Evelyn, how did the book Intuitive Eating come about? This is a, a project that Elise and I both came to. We were we were uh, working side by side in a actually not side by side the same office building. I was subleasing an office from her, and both in private practice, both helping pa patients to lose weight. We would do the traditional uh, exchanges. And our patients would lose weight and they'd come back in and later they'd regain the weight back and they'd blame themselves. And Elise and I were just very frustrated with the process. It wasn't a very, we didn't feel very good uh, the way we were helping people and our patients were just blaming themselves. We thought there's got to be a better way. So we did a lot of things. We, I, we really looked into the research in terms of what's going on. Uh, we were looking at some of the uh, books at the time that were out like Janine Roth, um, Kirsch and Munter, Overcoming Overeating, where they, they were talking about eating whatever food you wanted to, and it sounded nice, but like, what, what was the research behind it? And actually, there was a lot of good research behind it. So between looking at all the research, the popular stuff, plus our clinical practice together, we came up with uh, the, the premise of intuitive eating. And so we turned it into 10 principles. It made it measurable. And so now, even though this book has been published 20 years ago, to date, there's over 40 studies on intuitive eating, and it's just like so exciting to see it. Um, being validated. I'd love to hear about some of the research about intuitive eating. Tracy Took was the one that really, to me, really put the intuitive eating on the research map with a really big study where she asked a couple of key questions. You know, number one, can we even measure objectively who an intuitive eater is? And basically, so what? You know? And what she found on, she looked at 1,400 uh, college aged women and found, yeah, there are some very key characteristics of intuitive eaters. They, um, are very much more in touch with their body. They eat when they're hungry. They stop when they're full. They um, have unconditional permission to eat, but with but with with attunement, and they can really distinguish between emotional feelings versus um, you know satiety and, and hunger and so on. So that was really cool. But what she found is that intuitive eaters were so much healthier in mind, body, and physical health. They had a better sense of well-being. They had better uh, trust in their body. They were um, they had more introspective awareness. And so let me pause and, and say what that is. Introspective awareness basically is our ability to perceive physical sensations that arise from within our body. So basically it just means you can, you're aware of your body senses. That makes, that makes a lot of sense. And then since then, there's been a lot of research using her, her um, measurement tool showing that intuitive eaters, when they do look at body weight as a whole in terms of a population study, they have lower body mass index without internalizing a thin ideal, lower rates of, of eating disorders, and even lower of, of blood levels of cholesterol and triglycerides and so on. So it looks really, really promising. And there was a big study published two years ago out of Diane Newmark Stainer's group. And they've been doing this big project called Project Eat where they have followed these adolescents into young adulthood. They followed them for 10 years. And in one part of the study, they looked at intuitive eating in terms of a health premise. And their conclusion was, yes, this is the way that we really need to go. And what was so stunning about their study and very sad is they found that the teens that started dieting it actually predicted more weight gain, more disordered eating, and all kinds of problems. And to me, the big takeaway message on that is dieting is not just some innocuous phase you go through. It's actually something that causes harm. And to me, the, the biggest message that we need to get out there, I think most consumers know that dieting doesn't work in the long run. But what they don't know is it actually creates more weight gain and it creates obsessionality with food. And now there's been even new studies showing there's a mechanism called fat overshooting, where not only do you regain the, the weight that was lost, you also gain back more fat. And tell me what's so healthy about that? You know, we need to change, change the paradigm. And so when you start looking at other things that are happening also right now, like the movement of health at every size, you know, it, it's, 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 it's long overdue. We need to be changing the conversation to healthy behaviors, period. It feels like there's a lot of unnecessary suffering around weight loss and weight regain. Oh my gosh, yes. When you start looking at the bigger studies, um, I already mentioned Diane Newmark's Stainer study, but there was another study looking at, I think it was 16,000 kids, a tremendous amount of number. And they looked at the kids who were dieting versus those who didn't. And what they found is the kids that were dieting were more more likely to gain weight, number one. But this, this part just kills me, is they were eight to 12 fold more likely to engage in binge eating. You know, that's just, oh, it, it, it's... 
and okay, I'm sorry, I, I get very uh, passionate about this. And then the study that just really, really blew me away, to me, put the nail in the coffin, was a, a group of researchers, you know, said, well, you know, maybe dieting uh, puts on, on weight, not because dieting is the cause of weight gain, but maybe people are genetically prone. Maybe it's a genetic disposition. So they looked at twins. They looked at 4,000 twins, 2,000 pairs in other words, and they followed them for five years. And what they found is that dieting independent of genetics was related with weight gain in a dose response manner. So the more that one particular twin dieted, the more weight they would gain um, compared to their counterpart who didn't diet at all. So like, this is just nuts. It's crazy. And probably the biggest study that really, really, uh, oh, that really showed this is a landmark study done in the during World War II with Ansel Keys, in which he took men, conscientious objectors, college-age guys, and put them in a study in which they basically cut their intake very, very, very low for the purpose of looking at how, how they can alleviate malnutrition with all the food shortages happening with uh, World War II. And what happened just blew me away. I remember in grad school when we were learning about this study. These guys, you know, some of the stuff was predictable. You know, they lost their hair, they got malnourished, their metabolic rate slowed down by half. But these men started to become obsessed with food. They started collecting recipes and cookbooks and didn't know whether to eat fast or whether to eat slow. And some of the men developed eating disorders. One man could not stand the protocol of this uh, diet. And he went out and stole candy. And he felt so guilty about it, he made himself throw up. And another man did a similar thing where he binged on milkshakes, felt so guilty, and made himself throw up as well. And so this to me is really, and even Ansel Keys says this as well, this has become the landmark study on what really happens to the mind and body with food restriction. And, you know, when I first was exposed to this study, I thought these guys were, you know, only eating a couple hundred calories a day. But on average, they were eating 1,700 calories a day and had this impact. So this is really, you know... What happens to you when you're basically dieting? And keep in mind, back when these guys are obsessing with food, food wasn't cool like it is today with the TV Food Network and celebrity chefs and all that kind of stuff. And so, you know, we, we can go all the way back to then and look at the problems and the pathology with dieting. I have this dream that one day they'll have warning labels on diet products. I've given talks to physicians. You know, I will say, I will say this, is that if you, if you had a medication, let's say to help lower someone's cholesterol, and it lowered cholesterol in the first few months, but then it was shown to actually not only raise cholesterol but cause your arteries to close, would, would there be any way at all that you would use that medication? It's like, hell no, you know? And yet we know with the dieting research, and there's a body, a preponderance of evidence on this, and yet they keep going back to the same, same idea. And, you know, you know what kills me is that Lisa and I were just talking about this. You know, I, I see a lot of patients for this issue, and they, and they say to me, yeah, this diet really worked, And because I'm asking about their dieting history, and it's like, wait a minute, did this really work? What happened to your body? What happened to your mind being on this diet? You know, and so, no, the diet really didn't work, and it's the only industry with a product that I know of that doesn't work and the consumer blames themselves. You know, what great model for repeat business is that? Talking about creating repeat business, Weight Watchers is one of them. What do you think about Oprah going to Weight Watchers? I was really disappointed to see that. Here we have a very, very successful woman, very affluent, and it's like, of all industries to get into, why why this one? And so this I can only, it's, it's me speculating. I don't know her, I've never worked with her, but I've certainly, I used to subscribe to her magazine and I watched many, many, many of her shows. And my sense and my perception about her is she's never really made peace with food. She's had you know, a trainer, she's had a chef, but I don't know if she's really worked on healing her relationship with food, mind, and body. And the truth is you really can't take anyone than you've ever taken yourself. You know, you can't take anyone any further than you've taken yourself. Yourself. And so if she hasn't healed in that, that's probably a blind spot she has. We now train health professionals to become certified intuitive eating uh, counselors. I want to make sure there was a standard in which people were using intuitive eating because as it started to grow in popularity, we were seeing some things that we that were very inconsistent. Like you don't go on a juice fast and do intuitive eating, for example. So anyway, with, what I'm finding very intriguing is we're getting more and more uh, former Weight Watch leaders who are now 
really saying, you know what, this is crazy. This is not working. And it's like, ah, so it's, it's you know, it's, it's really wonderful to hear their personal stories because they've been in the trenches. They've worked with a lot of these people and they really know the fallacy, you know, behind it. But sadly so, I think, you know, when people are desperate and vulnerable, they'll, they'll try anything. And then when you have a company that has celebrity spokespeople, you know, it just, it dangles that carrot. Oh, oh, I'll be different. I'll be the one. It's like, you know, how many, how much pain, how much suffering do you have to go through to realize that our body needs nourishment the way our, our lungs need air to survive. And if we don't get enough food, it's going to set a biological cascade and a psychological cascade that's going to keep you focused on eating, eating, eating. But you know, ultimately what I also find, and I see this with uh, newer dietitians in the profession, and as you know, I'm a dietitian, and when there's some mm, lack of experience, sometimes there's this idea that, oh, I just put them on this beautiful diet, they'll lose weight. But what I find is when they've had enough experience with people, give them a couple of years, and they realize, oh my gosh, this is not a satisfying way to work with people. And this doesn't work. And it, it doesn't feel good. It doesn't feel good for the health profession to be working in this in this manner, you know? So it's nice to see people like Tracy Mann and other health professionals like uh, who are coming out and really publishing lay books. Linda, Linda Bacon has done that with Health at Every Size and now her new book, Body Respect. So, you know, maybe we're getting to a point where we're going to see the tide changing. And sometimes it's us health professionals that need to first educate other health professionals. And maybe we have to say it 10 times. They need to hear it 10 times. And maybe we're just the first, but we got to keep on keep on doing this. To me, it's, there's no such thing as a sensible diet, and it's not ethical to put anyone on a weight loss kind of diet. This is Carrie corbett Owen from BodyWise Perfect Size, and I've been talking to Evelyn Triboli from Intuitive Eating. For more from Evelyn and other wonderful health at every size experts, please go to bodywiseperfectsize.com, Hayes Videos. Thank you.